Well, good afternoon and welcome to Norfolk Constructing Excellence um, on the 10th of November. Um, nice to see so many of you on the call today. We've had quite a lot of um, people register their interest, so we're sure there'll be a few more people joining the call as, as we progress. Um, just a bit of basic housekeeping, if I may, um, to make it a bit easier for people to concentrate on the event, if you could mute your um, self and close your video screen down that would be really appreciated we'd be able to then focus on the presentation in hand um, so introductions today um, very um, glad to bring Hannah Corlett to you today to talk about future cities and some of the work she's been doing um, in London um, and many thanks also to Excel Works today who are supporting the event and sponsoring us um, Without them, we wouldn't be able to pay for the Zoom license. So we'd, I'd just be talking to myself in a very empty room. So thanks again, Lee Burgess and Excel Works. Um, if you want to find more information about Excel Works and their business, you can navigate obviously through our website on our sponsors page and you'll be able to click through to find more about them. So um, I'm gonna move at pace today so we can keep the energy up and move very swiftly towards our presentation today. Today's talk is Hannah Corlett. She's a lecturer at UCL College, um, amongst other things, and she's shortly going to be sharing her screen and unmuting her mic and able to present to us today her talk. So over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Owen. Well, hello everybody and thank you for joining. Um, obviously Future Cities is a, is a very broad title um, and so in order to present something that can be sort of discussed in an hour and that hopefully you can engage with and ask questions about, I've actually focused on one particular project that we have done recently that for me certainly um, stretches across multiple scales and when we think about the future of cities we need to think about it um, at both the, the, the macro and the micro scales. And it also addresses several of the issues that I think are, are both um, long-term um, considerations and also very topical considerations in the, um, is, with regards to the changes in the way that we're living and working. Um, for me, those have been sort of whittled down to three, and that's not to say that there are only three. But um, they, I'm looking at certainly at physical and economic scale, regardless of the city, this is, this is an issue. We're definitely moving towards a larger scale economy, whether it be the businesses that we deal with, whether it be the banks that we used to know who we were dealing with, have phone calls with individuals, um, but also the physical scale of the city. And that's something that our, um, we at HNNA try to, um, to work against when it doesn't seem appropriate for the occupants of the city. The second one, which I'll talk about later, is the encouraging innovative thinking. And so with regards to the master plans that we look at, we always try and make sure that those who are both going to occupy them or going to fulfill them in terms of the design team, that they are a platform for, for the innovation of others and that they don't, they don't restrain those who are taking part in the master plan. And then finally, the kind of interest. Um, designing in moments, surprises and change, which is really key to what we do and should be key um, to why and how we enjoy a city. And I think it is, but sometimes actually that's lost in the process of design. Um, so first off, we're looking at the physical and economic scale. Um, the, the scale of project that um, I've chosen to look at is in itself vast. It is the Greenwich Peninsula Master Plan. For those of you who don't know, um, Greenwich well. It's, it's known for the what used to be the Millennium Dome is now the O2 but it's a peninsula that's in the east. It's just opposite as you can see um, Canary Wharf, you can see the, the tall towers and then further west you can just make out um, from this image the, the gherkin and the shard. Um, but it's a huge landmass and it has had an industrial past that has meant that it's been somewhat neglected. It's had various different master plans that have over the years um, been sort of shelved for different reasons and we came on board um, at Allies and Marsden approached us in just before 2015 to look at the master plan and to give you a sense of the scope of it the model that's on the left hand side 
the white images, the white um, sort of massing is, is massing that already exists. You might recognize obviously very little on the peninsula at that time. So it can, constituting a sort of gas holder and the Millennium Dome really. But, and then see some of the massing that is going on for the Canary Wharf um, beyond. But there's a lot of um, sort of darker brown timber and that denotes work that has um, gone in or received planning approval. And then all of the lighter timber, timber, which is mostly in the foreground of that photo, is actually constitutes the um, master plan that we worked on with um, Alice and Morrison for the peninsula. So you can see it's a huge amount of building. And in any situation like that on an empty site, um, it's, it's a, a, the direction that you take um, is really significant. Now, obviously with what had happened is that we had it gone through various iterations and that's to do with the market, global financial crisis, changes in the um, housing um, affordability with regards to profit for any developer to take it on. And it was actually only as a consequence of a change in the flight descent um, technology for um, city airport that we meant that we could actually deliver this as um, a, a feasible for the developer um, uh, offer um, because the, the steepness of the path meant that we could go taller than we could before and therefore we could get more density than previous master plans had achieved. But as you can see that that density make, makes it almost like Manhattan. Um, so it's, it was a huge undertaking to, to do that. And actually to start from, in effect, almost a blank canvas, although there's no such thing, we always deal with clients, we always deal with users. Um, it, we actually took, as you can see from the sort of site plan, the geometries of um, streets that had grown up in the duration of the Thames when it was an industrial um, offer, and they're often perpendicular to the water. So this sense of rather than as you get with some new developments, sort of clinging to the water's edge in order to maximise views. The, the master plan actually tries to um, reference some of the uh, historic streets going perpendicular and then using the angles of buildings to get um, views down rather than in effect lining the edge of the peninsula. And that means that the whole of the peninsula comes alive. There's no sort of bad spot in it. There's continuous views. It's not cut off from the Thames. It's very much linked to it. And this association between different sides of the Thames, both in terms of massing, is, is something that's quite common. The little image in the bottom there is actually showing the relationship between um, the Tate Modern and the proportions of the Tate Modern or the, or the Tate, um, the uh, South Bank uh, power station as it was, was built to reference St Paul's, which is off for it, opposite it. So that sort of referencing is something that um, is common to the Thames and we were keen to involve um, the new peninsula, not as an oddity, as another, um, but as part of the London network and as part of the, having a strong relationship with the Thames. Now, when you're looking at um, doing a new development like this, obviously you want to avoid the pitfalls of gentrification. And that can be difficult, it, particularly in a market that where um, affordability has gone down due to you know, various things, including Brexit, as we know. And so for us, it was important to ensure that that didn't happen, that the communities that um, actually are surrounding the peninsula, if not on the peninsula already, needed to feel that they weren't dislocated from the development we, went, um, we, were, we were undertaking then. And therefore, as a consequence, you can see where you have the park and the dome, there's a little patch of land that is in effect the heart of the peninsula. We proposed on the back of the teaching that I was doing, which was to do with um, urban colonization and gentrification, to propose um, in effect a lost leader. So we wanted a home for creatives that would be a permanent home. So not something where they use as catalysts to come and go, make the area popular and then be forced out because they're priced out, but actually to encourage um, a destination. So rather than have a generic piece of city, um, then we actually have something where it has an identifier and that identifier not doesn't come from a single landmark, but actually comes from a sense of place. And so the idea that this be a generator for creativity and, um, and also a destination for those who live on the peninsula um, was 
we're very grateful to say, um, fully and enthusiastically adopted by the client. So un, on the understanding, although it wouldn't make profit itself, um, and our job in effect was to make sure it was affordable um, with regards to the construction cost such that the rents kept, kept low, because if that didn't work, then the whole scheme would, wouldn't work. Um, but that actually by giving a sense of place, you would make the appeal of the whole peninsula greater and therefore it had worth in, in achieving that. Now, if you're looking for something cheap, that's, um, it can be easily rented by creatives, um, startups, you know, SME um, pra practices and, and um, makers and creatives. What you do is create a huge, big industrial shed, make it very cheap. Um, but we were determined that that would be actually quite alienating. If you complete the whole block as a single piece of big architecture, then it doesn't have a voice and, and, a, and a conversation with the community that surrounds it. So we looked at various different ways of breaking it up, whether it be in sort of quads or, or further um, iterations, and then actually made quite a fractured, very permeable um, piece of city that has entirely pedestrianized, that has a sort of hierarchy of different spaces, but was very much about um, a, a conversation between the visitors and the users. And there's a lot of sort of happenstance meetings that could take place in the spaces that surrounded the studios themselves. So when we set up the hierarchy, we actually, the, the central square is based on the um, proportions of the Royal Academy because that's a really successful art square. It's not too big, it's not too small, it kind of holds people. Um, and the surrounding buildings of the Royal Academy are actually the same or similar scale to the buildings that we're proposing. So it's quite formal and it's quite a formal square. And in a way it plays off as, as a destination within this destination by having a, a kind of similar geometry, but at an angle. And then you can see the lighter building, by lighter I mean thinner line, that was the idea of having a market so that in order for people to come here and sort of have, stay who are visitors, that you'd have a small independent um, F&B market and also it would give the people creating in the um, studios a chance to have an outlet and a retail outlet for their work. And adjacent to that is another small courtyard for outdoor eating. And the relationship between that market and the Marks Barfield building, which, which are the ovular buildings that pre-existed, um, was really important. And actually now the market is currently being constructed, it's really nice to see the relationship and the sort of way that the mouth of those two um, ovular shapes in the Marks Barfield building sort of invite you into the district and into the market. The other courtyards, we wanted to be working courtyards. So these are where, I mean, we always talked about with the client, you know, where do you paint the canoe? The idea that something be immaculate and sort of preserved was very against the types of users we wanted to be located here. So these working courtyards have much more informal geometry and are broken down such that um, they are sort of semi-private in that they're not as public as the other um, spaces, but they are all always still permeable. Light also important. We wanted the central square to get central square to get light at lunchtime in particular. And then we also wanted the avenues of access to receive light at the times of day when people will most be likely to using them. So our massing strategy um, was done such that you will see that some of the buildings, although they had a reasonably similar brief each, were actually designated to um, have certain sort of setbacks and cutbacks in order to allow light to enter the main streets and main squares. Active ground floors imperative. It's really important in your public realm that your the ground floors of the buildings are active. So we try to do away with um, uses that would be um, very sort of distinct in the times that they would be used. There's you'll see later there's minimal amounts of retail um, because the area had can't necessarily support it with footfall. But we also did without. Um, sort of blank reception spaces with a you know, sofa with no one sitting in it. Um, and we wanted people walking around the streets to be able to see people working, which is really the point of integrating the creatives with the community. Um, however, we know it needs to be flexible, things change. So you can see here that the um, F&B and, re F &B and retail are sort of focused very much around the square and around the main streets, but the other spaces are left to be um, working workshops at ground floor. 
we made all of the buildings shallow plans for so that they could be naturally lit and ventilated um, and actually did a work out this diagram shows two cores but each building has only one core so they're very efficient blocks in isolation and we did all this before we appointed the architects we believe in sort of working certain things out to save other architects fine it's time and then actually allowing them to use that as a platform to build off now as you saw the surrounding um, master plans very high so the fact that this area be, was kept low and in our own planning document we kept it to 25 meters aod which is actually now as a planning condition against which other things will be built it means it can't be knocked down and replaced with towers which was important to um ensure that it's a long-term offer and it's not a temporary um, uh, sort of make a space for uh, in order to lift the area but become a permanent heart for the area and so we actually worked with looking at um, the roofscapes and elaborating the roofscapes we worked against plant always looking to contain it or minimize it on the roofscape and to enliven them in, and one of the reasons for keeping it low is actually to ensure that you can have accessible terraces at roof level very quickly, sectionally, they were, we encouraged each um, building to have the similar attitude, even though actually there were lots of constraints that we didn't put down. We felt that workshop suited ground, a sort of more standard, open, well-lit studio space um, could uh, offer a lot of creative space to work in, in the midsection of the buildings. And then there are a lot of creatives that really benefit from natural light um, and, and north light and high ceilings and aspect. All the fine artists, the photographers, they need these kind of spaces and our research showed us that. So the top floors is more your studio spaces that would suit those kind of tenants. Entrances, again, the affordability is not just the cost of the building. If you want people who to pay low rent, they also want to pay low um, sort of service charges. So everything needs to work for the occupants without a sort of overarching service charge of common receptionists, security, etc. So we designed it such that the communication tools of entering and exiting and collecting mail, etc. were also affordable. The stairs, there's only one stair in the plan and the, the format of each building is such that they only have one stair. And that stair is both the fire stair and it is the main um, access stair. They're not tall buildings, so we hope that they would be well used. And as a consequence, they're actually quite um, primary spaces. And so a lot, you'll see a lot of richness in the stair designs that have come out. Then the roof terrace. Obviously, it's our sort of fifth elevation, an opportunity, a place to be. It's in an environment that is well overlooked, but also actually um, a reasonably beautiful roofscape even when you're on site now actually sort of views across um, to the Thames are, are wonderful and as as is the, looking over to the dome it's a real opportunity and we wanted the architects to seize this and we also did all the working out for their basic sort of services and provisions and then we were really keen on the mixed voice. The client didn't really understand why we didn't want to do it all ourselves. Um, and, and I will admit some points in the journey, we also questioned why we didn't do it all ourselves. Um, but we really wanted this, because you, the, the creatives that would occupy it would also be a very mixed bunch. We were keen that the architecture have the same variety. Um, we There's a sort of, I think, it encourages innovation to give people not just a blank canvas to work with but a space that's already of interest i think it's it's a misnomer to think that creatives actually want a kind of um white box and um and that actually having different types of spaces would then also uh, adjust and accommodate different types of users so in order to do this, we split the plan, the, the city block, into um, 16 different buildings and they're standalone buildings so they don't touch. And we divided that between eight leading architects. We went from a very long list to a, to a short list in conjunction with the client. And each of those eight architects took two buildings and those buildings were never adjacent to each other. It's really the idea of having a sort of sense of familiarity across the district 
um, within designers, but also this sort of sense of breaking down each block so that the scale is always at a domestic scale, accessible, not intimidating scale. And so you can see how we've done this in terms of the division. And then we looked at setting certain criteria um, for the structure and the MEP, the, both the structural engineers and the MEP, it's the same one throughout, they were marvellous. Um, and they came on board before the architects did in order to ensure that certain um, guidance could be put in place um, to help um, make the journey quicker and more streamlined, um, but also test the master plan, make sure it could actually deliver a sustainable, affordable um, district. And then we even gave them kind of ratios. We know that if you do small buildings, the skin of the building is going to be expensive. So we gave them guidance ratios for the NIA and GIA and also the wall ratio to the GIA in order to assure its affordability. We gave them cost guidance for what their skin should be. But unlike most master plans, we didn't stipulate a materials palette. We really wanted the architects to innovate within cost constraints and obviously within you know, we're lo looking for Briam Excellent and we've got Briam Excellent. So from a sustainability point of view, we had much tighter constraints and cost, we had a tighter constraints. But in an environment like this, where you don't have a lot of pre-existing buildings that you can reference in terms of materials, we thought the materials and even the massing of the building was um, something where the each architect could innovate. And within that, the um, the plans were set out, but the sections weren't. So there's variety in section, there's variety in skin. And in our ratios, we did actually um, not make it such that it was an extrusion up to the height of the um, floor plans. There were some tolerances in that, and I'll go on to show you how each architect used those. So having set up a master plan that reduces the physical scale and the economic scale of the architecture and the city, how does this attitude, which is a very different attitude to most master plans, how does this encourage innovative thinking? Well, the best way of doing that is actually to take you through some of the architects and how they use the master plan we did in order to produce an innovative architectural solution. Um, so these are the, that's the that is an image of the combined master plan. You can see the variety of architectural styles, the difference in heights, the variety of materials, all coming out from constraints that didn't dictate those. Here are some beautiful um, images. I've got very few, I'm afraid, in the presentation in order to keep it down in time, but Taran Wilkie has done some fantastic photos of it on site. It's currently under construction. Um, and uh, I think when the scaffolding comes out, it'll be amazing. So the eight architects that we have, I've selected a few to show their innovation. We always talked about the variety of architects, including a Marmite um, architect, which is something when I say outside of the UK doesn't translate. But I know that um, as viewers, you'll understand that it's, you won't like all of them. It's sort of important that you don't. Um, if you liked all of them, they'd probably in a, be in a similar taste palette, but they're very varied. But they're chosen because they're all innovators. And I think Hopefully you'll see that in the solutions. This is the first building by Architecture 00. And looking at in the interesting way at which they approach that, because they had two buildings, each they had two directors, each taking a different building and almost competing with each other, um, which was fascinating to see. And they, um, uh, the first building that they tackled, they looked at the ratios that we gave in terms of efficiencies. And they thought, well, actually, if we're going to have the sort of comparison of NIA and GEA, then why don't we put all of the circulation on the outside? So all of the circulation from this building is external and, um, and you'll see that they've contained the external spaces with this um, innovative mesh. So it's actually quite a skeletal looking building, but it means it's incredibly efficient in terms of the ratios. And out of that efficiency, they actually were able to add a basketball court on the top floor, which is a publicly accessible basketball court and wasn't originally in the brief, but the efficiencies um, that they achieved allowed that. In the second building, we had height constraints with regards to the fact that we had a single core and a single access stair. 
And that meant that you couldn't go over 11 meters for your top floor and still have that as a, as a fire safe stair. Um, and the second director, Linton Pepper, took this challenge on. And actually in, in the place that, location that we'd put in one core, he designed a corkscrewing double core. So it corkscrews around each other, itself and gives you two staircases in the space of one, which meant that this is the only building where the floors go significantly above 11 meters. And you'll see both of their buildings are actually some of the tallest on, on the district because they've sort of innovated in this way. The next architect is Selgas Cano. We have two Spanish architects, Selgas Cano and Rosa Viega, who um, were you know, really lovely to work with. Um, and the one building that was slightly different in terms of it, its criteria was um, the market. And this is the market space that sort of sits in the mouth of the Marks Barfield building. And they actually, looking at the fact that it's, um, it's very permeable and low rise, as an offer, they've created an ETFE structure that um, opens up so that in summer it becomes an open air market and then closes um, in winter months. And then they have a central bay, a sort of spine of different um, smaller units that have seating on top and they allow um, independent um, retailers to almost have their own little mini kiosk or shop at a scale that would suit them, but that works as a street with regards to the market. So it's open at both ends and people passage through it, which is a really nice um, entry point onto the main square. Their second building actually faces onto a bus depot. And that bus depot with the development of the peninsula will be taking about um, approximately, I think, 100 buses per hour. So it's a vast um, sort of polluter in terms of sound and air and most of our designs obviously aimed for natural ventilation and lighting. So they took the um, design that we have done and on the end that actually addresses the bus depot, they've created a huge winter garden. So this winter garden again counts as external space, very lightweight weight construction, but gives a series of platformed meeting spaces where people can gather but acts as a, an acoustic buffer and um, for the bus depot at that end. The next architects was 6A and they actually have quite similar buildings so I'll just take you through one but they have uh, because of the way that their buildings were sited they were in similar positions but they both needed to allow light onto the market square and the main square and the main central route that takes you up through the district and the way that they did that was this using the chamfering effect and they appreciated that their buildings on the face that needed to be staggered was all were also north facing so in their studio spaces, they have these huge, huge, you can see from the section, the top floor is magnificent, where you have, it's, as, it's much taller than it is wide, linear studio space with incredible views, but all beautifully saturated by north light, so make exceptional studios for the creatives. And as they said, in any other plan, you would never do a triangulated building like this. But because of the constraints of the master plan and the opportunities of the master plan, they were actually able to affordably deliver a different kind of space. Now, our buildings, um, again, looking at the fact that we didn't have to extrude up from the plan, we looked at playing with the edge facades. So the two buildings um, have undulations either horizontally or vertically, depending on the building, but they were in quite different sites. One looked out onto the square and that um, was in a quite a contained site, but had one elevation that needed to um, sort of adopt to take some um, uh, some drenched area just outside the building and has a double height space within. Um, and within that, we really wanted to have captured space. So in the same way as you discovered the courtyards in the overall master plan, within this building, you discover the building, the um, captured space within, which I'll talk about a little more in the, the next section. And our second building has the undulations horizontally, and those undulations actually offer um, external space that aren't sat within the building, but are on the edge of the building, so that they buffer what is actually quite an exposed south facing building from the sun, but also with really usable external space. 
So in a way, you know, making reference to something that's very familiar, the idea of the master plan is actually to create a collection of, of different identities in the same way as this sort of child's game from the Eames did. It's, it's the idea that you sort of piece together individuals that are very eclectically different and then you get something rich out of it is what we wanted both from the occupants and therefore it's how we chose to deliver the architecture and it's how we chose to frame the urban design. So designing in moments and surprises. Now, hopefully the, the master plan itself does that. It's not a kind of pure grid. We always talk about it in terms of getting agreeably lost, even though you're actually just looking at one city block. It's the chance that you don't see your destination. You sort of weave your way through it and therefore you come across things and spaces that you weren't expecting. That's really important, as is the fact that you understand that with this type of um, user, as with, as with many users these days, whether it be housing or office space, there's a high degree of change. And so something can't work for the initial user only, and it needs to not be flexible because flexible implies that things return back and almost always they don't, they sort of move forward. But the, the fact that it can um, adopt and accommodate change is really important in the designing of the city, whether it's urban design or architecture. One of the things I'm passionate about is avoiding the generic city. And as I said, looking at the master plan initially, you could, because there is so few buildings on it already, you could have produced another Dubai or similar. And we were really keen that it wouldn't have that kind of brand dominated aesthetic. Um, and looking at this is quite a hot topic in many respects. People are discussing it, the, the issues of it. The fact that local architecture, local identity is being lost through a kind of generic architectural solution that is usually looking at the bigger, the better and um, a sort of similar delivered aesthetic um, so that wherever we are in the world, we don't necessarily, um, are, we're not able enough to distinguish the differences of those countries and that comes down to climate, it comes down to the materials in those um, uh, countries and the carbon footprints in related to um, importations, but it also comes down to the users. You know, they want to be able to associate with where they come from and therefore it needs to be identifiable in its own right. So a lot of what we look at is the sort of, in effect, designing in disorder so that things don't look new and perfect and glazed and tall and like everything else. And we do this understanding with who the users are and what's already there. Um, and this is something, again, that other people are writing about and other part people are acknowledging. The fact that independent sellers are being pushed out and the fact that people are feeling disassociated with their cities because of that is a really key part to designing cities and the future of cities. Um, we looked at for the um, Saul Biennale, we were look on the London stand and we got, I'm pleased to say, the, the um, identifier of London is a city to get lost in. And I consider that a really positive thing. And one of the reasons I think that it's positive is because if you have different types of space and that some of those spaces and opportunities are hidden and you have to discover them for yourself, then there is a sense of sort of belong belonging and connection. We often find our own um, communities because you're in a sort of um, common minority um, of whatever kind um, and or you have distinct interests and that platform, any platform should be able to support those differences. And so the idea that something be generic and similar throughout um, is what we move against in order to ensure that the experience of the city is very varied. So out of what looks like, um, when you zoom into the, the, the district, it looks quite um, random. You can see when you zoom out that it picks up a lot of the geometries that are already on site, but it then does have these sort of pockets. So it's deliberately trying to be different in scale. Obviously, it's a sort of domestic low rise pedestrianized um, block in a world of high rise um, vehicle driven um, 
master plan. And what we looked at is kind of trying to accentuate those differences as a positive thing, whilst not actually deliberately going so against the grain that it doesn't work and it doesn't have a conversation with its surroundings. Our two buildings um, are taken as exa examples here of how to create a new piece of city that doesn't feel too new. So in a way, the three sections that I've gone through have looked at um, design and the master plan, have looked at architecture, and now kind of like to talk about the detailing. And the detailing comes from how to create new buildings that speak of surprises and change and difference um, without looking like they sort of landed from space. And that's all too common nowadays that there's a charm. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's one of the reasons that people still use brick a lot is because it has that sort of, that sort of pre-aged familiarity. But I believe that brick's not the only answer and that there are other ways to make something feel that it has, isn't just sort of straight off the shelf, but it has a sense of belonging and of difference from day one. So as you can see, we've sort of set up the idea of this plan, this undulating plan. It's very much about having the pockets of spaces on the edges to occupy, a little bit like the idea of a bay window where you have a sense of space to be in and you're not necessarily confined into this huge rectangle of open plan. And then we have the surprises of the unexpected external space dropped into the top floor. We also have the sort of simplicity of a construction process that I will show you, creating a very different edge condition. So you see the top roof edge is undulating, but that's actually from a sort of common approach. All the curves are similar radius, and that's in order to keep it affordable, but to have this variety. And one of the reasons is that part of adopting change is understanding how sun and light actually creates different spaces, both internally and also in the sense that the building's skin is red. Now, all too often now we have these extruded, very flat um, architectural solutions. And unlike the historic architecture that we're used to, they don't actually capture light or shadow and there's no tracking of the sun. And I think it's very important that um, that, that tool is understood so that you get the changing face of the city and not just a single kind of uh, flat uh, it's facade. Um, here's the example of where we used the, the pitch of the roof is entirely the same throughout. So the undulations come only from the fact that the distance from the courtyard edge where the um, water runs onto is at di distant, different distance from the edge due to the undulations. But it's actually a really simple construction, as are the corners in the plan, because all the radiuses are um, the same, although we've got concave and convex, but it's actually quite a simple setup. Often people fear um, curved buildings because they think they're expensive, but this building is no more expensive than any others because of using slight distortions in a sort of setup pattern to create those differences and those changes. And here you can see the moment at which the sort of light, the sort of drop down box um, is achieved. And as I said, I, I like to think it references the way that you discover the central square in the plan of the district. Our other building is, you know, much more ephemeral in that it's a sort of, we call it the woolly jumper, and it's like it has this um, simple um, translucent skin that acting as solar shading, but it also acts as balustrading and protection for um, the spaces, the external spaces, and for the completely accessible roof terrace on the top. Again, it's done really efficiently, other than the corners, all of which are the same. All of the banding are the same width and they're the same extrusions as each other. And so it's actually reasonably simple to mass produce this. The windows, albeit they're huge, they're sort of, um, they are similar to each other in scale. And so there's a lot of duplication in this to make it affordable. So the complexity comes out of something that's much more simple and efficient. So this brings us back to, in a way, I think my attitude towards a lot of architecture is how you see people treat the arts. And you do need to learn how to do things the right way, shall we say, first. But then once you have that knowledge, you can start to play with it. And I think this, this example is great in that you have 
Monet underst- obviously can paint and he can paint and do really good likeness. However, once he's learned that, he sort of manipulates it and distorts it to create something that's much more provocative and that is um, a, and that almost builds on the strengths that he's already acquired. And we try to do that in terms of architecture, understanding what we know to be efficient and then adding a little bit of slack in order to have play with that. It's something I think that's coming through generally in all forms of the arts. I mean, you may think this is a very odd slide, but it's a little bit the way we went through the sort of the EU constraints of sizes of um, carrots, straightnesses of carrots, how much a banana should bend, um, means that we have all this waste as a consequence. And I think most people realise actually that's not needed. Um, we don't need to regulate, things don't need to ha- be sort of too controlled. We can cope with a bit of difference where difference is, um, is, avoids waste, certainly, but also where it gives variety. So looking at the recent Ardmore um, films, we've actually looked at them per- almost being able to perfect a CGI and then they're returning to the sort of imperfections of where you get a little bit of a thumbprint on your plaster scene. And in some ways, I think new build buildings have gone too far towards efficiency. And now they need to bring back some of the changes that make it a little bit more um, of an interactive experience, looking at building skins or experiencing buildings themselves. So the way that we did this with our buildings is we looked at the different elements and then how to build those in to make them include variety and change and maybe Um, slight distortions. You can do that obviously through the distortion of the material and the lapping of it, but as you'll see on the right hand side we also looked at actually taking some of the pins out when you do a perforation to create a little bit of variety within the skin so it wasn't quite as perfect as the middle session, but that also was something that we needed to do for to get the correct solar shading so it worked in our favour. Likewise, with the GRC panels of the last building that faces the park, that, um, I mean, all with GRC technology, it's all about removing the air bubbles and a lot of effort has gone into doing that. And we actually talked to the cons- um, manufacturers about not doing that because actually the air bubbles give this sort of variety and texture that we actually really liked. And it may- meant the panels weren't all the same. They're regulated, so they have to be the same. So the contractor this, and the, the sort of manufacturer didn't really understand why we didn't want them to meet their own regulations. But it's in understanding that actually the natural process of something can make it quite beautiful and it doesn't need to be regulated out. We did, a, looking at a different project, so I thought at the very end of the talk, I'd introduce some how the similar ideas can come into other projects. This is a very simple house. I'm glad to say we've been shortlisted for the um, House of the Year 2020 by the Architectural Review. Hopefully we'll win, we'll see, fingers crossed. Um, but it's actually a very simple house that adopts some of the approaches that we've had in the other work that I've shown you from the design district. Here, the idea of simple brick laying and keeping the excess of mortar that you would normally scrape off to give a variety of texture to catch a light and so that the building itself looks um, a little bit more, less formal, but also it, the way that the light tracks around it is very varied during the day. Making the contrast here of this kind of blind facade with steps towards the main door where you are setting up the surprise of what might be within. And as you can see, it's a very simple plan, but inside, other than the two um, facades, which because of the strong Brisbane sun, protect you from um, the exterior, the interior has these huge expansive views across Brisbane, which you're obviously not expecting from the facade. And here is our scheme for the Iraq Parliament, um, which we did some years ago now. But again, it relates to the sort of ideas we have about contained space. It's very similar to the courtyard housing, which is typical um, in the Middle East, um, of having public space can being wrapped and contained and being come across as a surprise can make it very wonderful, but it also makes it very usable. You yourself feel contained within it. And also the facade, again, using the little bit of excess that we actually needed 
in order to make the building so that it could be um, battle proof. So it goes beyond what's required structurally. They're, all of these um, fins are at one of two angles. So there's very, there's quite a lot of efficiency in it, but the fact that there's a few more than is needed and we can use the slight variety gives it real complexity. And sadly, the building on the right is not mine, it's uh, Jean Nouvel's Louvre, but we can see that, that other people are doing this. So to get that complexity and layering through actually quite efficient skins, but um, slightly overlapped or changed, gives you a sort of really nice quality that is not dissimilar to how we um, experience nature, for example, in the forest. Um, and I think it's the next step forward for architecture. Um, last couple of slides, merely to say that, and I think it's really valid in Norfolk, what I've shown you so far are all kind of new builds, almost blank sites. Um, and what I do with my teaching, I teach a course that's architecture and historic urban environments. And it's about working with historic contexts and understanding them and understanding them such that you can sympathetically um, respond to them. And here in Mayfair, we did the master plan for Mayfair and it produced the Mayfair neighbourhood plan, which has now been fully adopted by Westminster, I'm pleased to say. It's really about looking about what's already there that's great, that can be built on. So understanding the possibilities of it. And in this case, we're looking to develop the what used to be the Tyburn River into a pedestrianised um, high street for independence to sort of play off of the offer of Oxford Street and also looking at the sort of isolating effect of Park Lane, how it doesn't need to be quite so traffic orientated and could be a really um, approachable edge rather than the hard edge it is. It's all about looking at what's there already and building on it. And very lastly, uh, our, uh, as a, an image that I did for a recent Highline competition and again, it's to show that a lot of the richness comes from what's already there. So the layered nature of the, um, the canal, the roadway and the rail, the colour from the occupants and the users, the, um, uh, the, the effects of the lighting of the redundant infrastructure is wonderful. There's often a lot that you can um, build on that we try and actually bring in when we deal with a new site so that you are adapting to the possibilities of the user. But actually, if you've already got users and you've already got architecture, that's a really strong position to be in. And I'd love any questions, if anyone has any questions. Thanks very much, Hannah, that's brilliant. I just heard a chime at the end of that. I don't know if it was me or you've got a, a musician with you helping you on oh, that. Oh, it might be my cat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It was very, very timely indeed. So we've got a few questions. Um, I'll start from the top. There's, there may be a few repetitions in there, but I'll, I'll go from the top. And if, if you can spare a bit more time with us today to, to go through that would be really, really great. Um, so John Norcliffe has uh, got a question there. Were uses grouped by a block or mix? Uh, and I guess he's referring to the, you know, the, the first stage of the master planning in terms of how you had your spatial st strategy in place. Sectionally, the types of space are varied, but what was really interesting is that we set off the master plan with about sort of two years to go. And because it was aimed at startups, we know those startups wouldn't exist. Um, by it's by their essence, if they were sort of still going in two years, they weren't really starting up. So we had to research spaces elsewhere without having specific users in mind. So there were no existing tenants when we started and therefore the, the, the types of space needed to accommodate different types of user. But we knew that sectionally the building could accommodate different users quite well with regards to the relationship with the ground, lighting conditions, etc. So it was more about giving variety of space than actually sort of types of use. Other than the retail, which, um, which we actually became a specification that we rolled out in terms of the glazing and fire strategies and access for the whole of the ground floor so that anything that needed to be turned over to, to retail could be. But the idea is that it doesn't need to be in terms of the working building and a limited amount of F&B then it was actually um, kept flexible. 
so that it could change. And that was important um, other than the market. Yeah. Um, got a question also from Lee. It's very similar in the sense that um, Norwich has just received some uh, funding from central government to consider a tech hub. Um, has there been any um, considerations for the district to have um, tech companies in it? Was, was there any leading people involved with that or drive? Yeah, I mean, we had the, the servicing is such that because it was, it's basically a contaminated site and didn't have utilities at all. It was prior to being the district, it was just a park. Um, so actually the, the level of servicing um, such that we don't end up with a roofscape full of plant um, and, you know, sort of AC units to cool down your server, etc., was such that um, it, was, it was very high spec that's been put in. And that's actually one of the expenses that we've had to accommodate. With the tight grain, if you actually sort of cut into those and saw the streets, the sort of section of those streets, there was so much servicing that's gone in. And that's on the understanding that we actually don't really know what's going to be required going forward, but this needs to cope with, with startups. And startups are usually at the front edge of kind of technological use and their sort of power and data requirements are you know, often quite demanding per person compared to lots of other companies. So we spec'd it assuming that we are actually going to get quite uh, a sort of, uh, a, so we say data heavy clients. Mm. Okay, um, and also another one from John Norcliffe around, um, obviously master plans do, do come very rarely. We don't have too many in our lifetime in, in the areas that we work in. So John's asking here, can you offer any thoughts on what interventions can be successful to act as a catalyst to trigger some regeneration? Um, I'm, I'm quite mindful of a few sites and towns and cities around this region that they just need that spark maybe to, to move things forward. So have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously affordability is key. Um, and I think actually a lot can be done with regards to um, the, the, the government or the council to support um, at any developer taking it on. I mean, if there's not, if there's not a lot of profit in, in a development, then obviously a developer doesn't necessarily, is not encouraged to start it up. And at the same time, if the, the, the development isn't affordable, then they can't get tenants. So it's this bizarre kind of 20 to, you know, catch 22 situation. But what we did was actually, because the developer had taken on more than one small site, then the efficiencies could be taken across the district. And that's quite rare. But I think it's important that um, having an understanding where you can have um, an exchange so that you are, aren't demanding too much from every single small pocket site, then you get the sort of quid pro quo where the developer makes it affordable and the, the um, tenants aren't priced out. Um, and so, and it, but it also gives you variety. If everybody takes their small plot and they have to deliver X, Y, Z from it, then they're all going to achieve the same across the jigsaw. Um, and I think what was great about this district is, is we could sort of, you know, dare I say, rob Peter to pay Paul. Um, but there are ways that the, 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 um, the council can encourage that, understanding that, you know, that, that you can spread affordability, not evenly, but in, in different places. Also, congratulations on the, the local plan with Mayfair. Um, in London, I get, I'd imagine that's quite a challenging piece of work. I know in Norwich at the moment, they've got some time challenges um, and considerations in line with the, the planning white paper as well. So um, a place like Mayfair is, I'm sure, a really interesting story. Maybe we'll have you back at some point to talk through that as a process. I'd be happy to, yeah. No, it was great. I actually really enjoyed it because it's quite a small, dense location um, and it's got a lot of richness to it. And also, you know, people who live there are really passionate about it, which I, I think is great. So it was really enjoyable. Two questions I'll roll into one here. So Saul Humphrey um, has mentioned working from home. It seems to be the, the new phrase of the year. So home working obviously is a challenge um, and may affect viability. John Norcliffe's also suggesting obviously retail is struggling as well. And there's mm -hmm. many vacant spaces above existing buildings. So I think maybe there's a potential of linking the two things there together. 
um, and also the, the, the ground level um, concept you was talking about of having live environments at, at ground level is for, very key to that. Um, have you got any thoughts or something you can share on that? Yeah, I think um, I think it's true about retail, I, and we always knew that with all the um, there's developments elsewhere on the district, for example, around the new um, tube um, in North Greenwich Tube. That's that's where there was already a lot of retail focused, and so the worst thing that you can do is is make provision for retail, and that there isn't the footfall to serve it. So not only is it not economically viable but also creates dead space and it creates dead public realm and dead streets and so every, all of the district works to have absolutely no retail at all if you wanted to other than the market um, and so that was important to us to be able to make sure it, it wasn't a sort of dead ground floor um, the other thing i think that's what the district has done well is it was set up as this platform to offer different types of leases I think the, the start entry in for most SMEs taking on a two and a half or five year lease with deposits, et cetera, is hugely prohibitive. And so even before COVID, lots of people were working from home or they were you know, working in what actually isn't particularly economically viable rent by the desk spaces. So the idea that the entry level be kept at um, low and therefore that's what drove the fact that we needed to keep the construction cost low was for all sorts of different lease offers. Now there's some that are being rented out on the desk by the hour to whole floors that can be rented out, um, but it gives you that flexibility. Um, and also the buildings are able because of their central core to be subdivided um, or you know, halved or exist as open plan to cope with the fact that there'll be different demands of users. And I think most of the shared working space um, and the, particularly the, the short term or low entry level leases is gonna be really appealing to a lot of people who, yes, they want to work at home, but they don't wanna meet anyone at home. They want to work at home, but they don't wanna make certain things at home. There are times when you need to go in and you need to be in a workspace, even if it's just because you're going mad. Um, and having that flexibility, I think is great. And it was always designed with that flexibility because the types of users that we've got um, are, are ones that may not need a huge space for five years. Um, so it's been built in, but I hope that other, you know, landlords certainly will kind of review their leasing strategy because it's just really prohibitive to the groups that are actually contributing incredibly heavily to our GDP. Um, at that entry level. Thanks, Anna. Um, I think you've also answered Lewis Bill's question there. Oh, just as we, just as I was about to sign off, James Ross has popped in as well. With um, was there a single executive architect, or did each practice work directly with the contractor? Or to... um, um, we, yeah, that's a good question. Both the client said, and the contractor, and the structural engineer, and the QS, and the M&E engineer said, we're only doing this if you coordinate them all. So we were the design coordinator. We also coordinate the sort of CMT roles for each of the architects. They were individually innovated, um, but even through the whole design process, we actually sat sort of, even though we were one of the um, eight architects, we also were the person to whom they all presented alongside the client. So we had a full, you know, start to finish coordination role and the only reason that people would take on that many different architects, because at, at one point, I think maybe still true, there's more architects working on that design district, different architects than there are in the whole the rest of the peninsula. Wow. So it doesn't make a lot of sense, but the only reason it made sense is because we stayed on from start to finish to make sure that it wasn't a headache for everyone else. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Hannah. That's absolutely amazing. Um, there were some really insightful snippets of information in there. I'm already in my mind thinking things in Norwich and the Norfolk area linked to the Eastern Gateway, which is a master plan in, in its early stages um, and something that I think we are all still waiting on a um, judicial decision at Anglia Square um, on the other side of Norwich. So there's a few things in there that I think are very, very relevant to, mm. to what we've got coming forward in the, in the future in Norwich. Um, there was one concept in there as well, I think early in your slide deck, um, like a meanwhile use um, market food place, which we've had 
one of those in Norwich's junkyard market, and that's that's been hugely successful. Um, so there's, there's, there's lots of synergies in, in what you've already achieved there that, that might be coming to us in Norwich. What I've found as well is the key, the key part that I've taken away, my takeaway point is character and charm. Although we're talking about the future and mm. modern buildings and modern modern processes, I think places need to retain their natural charm that they have um, unless you're building a new settlement. But even then, it needs to have some sort of significant hook to make it feel like a place people want to be and identify with. So really great to have you on, Hannah. And um, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Welcome. And we'll have you back again soon, maybe, to talk about the Mayfair. That'd be great. Uh, master plan. So thanks again to Hannah um, and to XL Works, who sponsored today's um, talk. I hope you've all found it very interesting and enlightening. Next month, we have um, Ed Gillespie joining us again. I think it's his third year in a row. Um, if you've listened to his talks before, they're absolutely amazing. He's fast paced, snappy, witty, controversial, um, and humorous. And they are really great events. So spread the word, um, let your colleagues know about this one. It really is a very, used to be a very well attended when we all met in the real world. And we're hoping for some significant numbers to join us online. And that event will be sponsored by Redhead Architects, who I believe are celebrating one year in business um, at the moment. Today, I'm going to try something quite interesting. Um, we've got 67 of you still on the call. We do have the ability to send you all to a breakout room. So at the end of this um, presentation, I'll play a short video and I'm just going to send you all out. So if you're on the call still, by the time I've finished, you're going to end up in a random room and you get the ability to turn your screen on, turn your volume on and have a chat with people that you might not have seen for a while. So. Um, it just leaves me to say thanks very much to everybody. Goodbye. Um, and the short video you're about to see um, is to pre-warn you that the awards for Constructing Excellence will be with us soon. <laughs>